Excuse me, guys. Sorry about that. Get some light in here. All righty. I think I'm ready to roll here. Excuse me, guys. Sorry about that. Cool, so we're live on YouTube. Okay. Looking good, looking good. All right. Let's go ahead and record this sucker. Hey, thanks everybody for joining. Um, hope you're having a great day here. I know this is noon, the middle of your day. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna jump right into this. I felt compelled to create this training because I was, I've been talking to people a lot and I've been having to educate them on their thought processes as because they've been coming to me with, a certain thought when it comes to outsourcing um, certain job roles in their company. Let me give you an example here, guys. Somebody wants to hire a lead manager or a cold caller, and they're coming to me saying that, hey, I want to hire this cold caller, but are this lead manager, but they want them to do acquisitions, lead management, and they're trying to hire one person to do everything. And they may be an American to do this, or they may be putting too much on their Filipinos plate all right, guys, our employees are not superhumans, just like us. We guys, we cannot, we can only do so much in a day and we only have certain skills. One thing I've realized is that a lot of people think vir Filipino virtual assistants, they can just give them anything to do. And I thought I had that same thought process. I literally did. I thought Filipino virtual assistants were, um, you could just give them a, a task and they could just do it all. But guess what, guys, I realized that Filipino VAs are just like us. They're people and they have specific skills. And I found myself blaming, blaming them for the inadequacies in my business. And this is a big, big issue. And it took me some soul searching and also having to, you know, talk to a few other people and them be realistic with me and say, you might want to look at their skill sets to see if you're actually one providing the training and support that they need when they come into business. Am I just print them in the business and just letting them go uh, and just just call people, call sellers or giving them random tasks without having any sort of um, vision for them? I've done that before. And that can contribute to your VAs not showing up. And guys, a lot of times too, your virtual assistants, especially Filipinos, they are so loyal to you. And we want to, uh, my whole mission here is to find a sidekick for every investor. You guys, to, to make 50000 or even six figures a month investing, wholesaling, you only need like two core people in your company, in-house employees. I'm going to talk about that later, in-house versus out, out, outhouse, um, outsourcing employees, right? So you only need probably like two core people, your lead manager and your operations manager, then you can outsource cold calling. And that's another thing too, guys, is the closer that you get, to um, the closer that your virtual assistants get to you as far as making decisions, the higher IQ that they need to have, the more um, the more uh, strategic thinking skill sets they need to have, right? I don't need my cold caller to be able to have a PhD. He doesn't need to have a PhD or a law degree. Hey, can, can you breathe? If you could breathe and, 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 and go through my script, you can do that job. And there's a particular payment, left or right limit, payment limits that we have for people. We don't need somebody that is exceptional at English and negotiations just qualifying. That's like saying with your direct mail, I'm going to have on my direct mail piece um, on, on the envelope, all these stamps and stuff to try to get the person's attention. At the end of the day, that's not going to convince the seller to sell their house to you. It may increase your open rate and your response rate, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the mail piece isn't meant to negotiate or do anything other than qualify the seller, right? And I want you guys to look at your business as if it's a franchise. And 
Think about McDonald's. Some McDonald's franchises are making twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars a week, with the average age of those people being 15, 16, 17 years old. And I've seen over time they made these the 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 processes at McDonald's so stupid, so stupid simple. I look at the screen there, and it literally has a button where it says burger, double cheeseburger, triple cheeseburger. I don't even think it has words. I think it just has pictures. Literally, a monkey could do it. Not taking anything away from those workers, but I'm telling you guys, McDonald's could make that process super complicated. They could make that making a burger seem like the most difficult thing ever. And it probably was initially, but it's our job to make sure that we are breaking down our task for the lowest common denominator for that position. We should not be, our, our, our businesses should not be dependent on the employee. And this is what I've seen a lot of investors do. They they think they're they have a business, and just because you're closing deals doesn't mean you have a business. Oftentimes, it's built on the back of one or two employees, and they know the job. And guess what? Once they walk, you have no idea what what their processes are, what they did to even um to what 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 they've been doing for the past you know year or so. So I went through this actually, where I was I was getting a little bit um. I was getting a little bit um, <laughs> carried away with my virtual assistants because they were really good. And I remember I built a team. This was like in 2019, 2020, and they were doing a lot for me. And it got to the point where I took my eye off the operations part of it, not operations, but the um, the the documenting of systems part of it. And they were just doing everything themselves, right? They were doing everything themselves. I said, hey, wait a second. I found that I was putting a little bit too much on my operations manager. And if she walked, because one day she took her, she had to take a couple of days off guys. And when she walked for those couple of days, my company, it all fell on my shoulders. And I had to like get, figure out where my log is, where I didn't know the log is to my tools. Everything is backed up now. And, and we communicate through Slack so we can, um, so we can have that collaboration in our team. And we know everybody's, up to date on everything that's happening in the business. All right, guys, that's my little spiel there. Let me, um, I'm going to stop sharing here because I want to go back and forth and just see what the chat's like. Um, guys, hey, communicate with me. Uh, this is live. So I don't. I just don't want to be like talking um, to myself. This is a perfect time for us to, for us to drop some questions here. I'm going to be going through this workshop, but uh, I'm going to be asking your feedback over, um, during this call, right? We'll be asking for your feedback during this call and um, and sharing some stories with you guys here as well. So let me, um, all right, we got somebody in um, on YouTube, Chevelle Diaz. Hey, Chevelle. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm gonna mute you, Mufasa. All right, guys, so. YouTube's looking good. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this. So guys, what have, it, what have been up to since uh, 2020? So the reason why I start this date is because this is when I really start to get serious about um, op systematizing my company. And let me tell you guys what that word means because processes and systems get thrown around so much. Guys, if there's something that you do on a daily basis that that's over and over again, you know, and majority of the stuff that we do in our company is uh, we do over and over again, uh, that needs to be turned into a system. That needs to be turned into a system. That needs to be turned into a process. What was happening to me is this. I was having this revolving door of talent coming in and out of my business. Guys, I tried this with Central American virtual assistants, Americans, um, you know, Filipinos, Indians, Pakistanis, guys, every single um, ethnicity I attempted to hire. And it's important because I say ethnicity because there's certain um, really regionally certain individuals uh, or certain countries specialize at certain things like the Philippines, they specialize in BPO, customer service, Indian of uh, uh, India and Pakistanis, I've noticed that they specialize really good when, they, um, when they're outsourcing 
it with tech stuff, like building websites. So when I was, I started to notice this and I realized that even if I was, I was trying to hire somebody from Pakistan to do cold calling from me, our India guys, that's just not going to work. I'm telling you because India unfortunately has a bad rap because a lot of people get scammed by these Indian, like, um, you know, uh, scamming, uh, they have these scamming warehouses and stuff. So that's just an area we're not going to go towards, but I do hire, um, Indian virtual assistants for working on my website, right? So understand that there's, you got to know where to look and what you're looking for. And you can't fit a square, um, a square peg into a circle, meaning trying to hire virtual assistants um, to, let's just say, trying to hire a $3 virtual assistant to do acquisitions. How, how, <laughs> yeah, you could pay them three dollars. How motivated do you think they are going to be, and how qualified do you think they are going to be to do that job? Right? You might need to pay them a little bit more to get, um, to get solid talent. So that that's another thing I've seen. A lot of people want to pay their VAs the most minimum amount in order to, um, and, and try to load them up with a lot of work. And I'm going to tell you guys how I, you know, sort of mitigate that and get around that. But let me tell you guys what was happening back in 2020. Um, I had, I was hanging out with my friends one night and I had this executive assistant that I hired from, I think it was either Upwork or Freelancer.com. And she just didn't work out. It was on both of us now that I look back on it, but um, I didn't really know what to train her on, but I had her doing some things and I, and I probably had her, um, go in my business and do some things in my business and gave her too much access initially. And this scared me for a couple of months from hiring VAs. In the middle of the night, luckily I was awake. It was like 3 a.m. She went in PayPal and sent herself um, like $3,000. And it was like through like four payments. And I was sitting there. She changed my password and everything. And let me know if you guys have had horror stories. You guys, if you've been around for a minute, you probably have horror stories like this from VAs and stuff, ripping you off or um, not uh, being very forthcoming with you or working two jobs. Guys, I know. And oftentimes we could say, see, I told you so. That's why we don't hire, you know, people from overseas. That's why we hire Americans. Guys, I'm going to tell you if it's American, v Filipino, Australian, it don't matter. These issues just come with the territory of hiring people. And I noticed the reason why I'm talking about hiring and I talk about marketing guys, but the reason why I talk about hiring now is because this is the automation. The automation is not a tool. It's not REI reply. It's not even investor fuse. You need operators that are really good at managing your system where you have choke points and they're going to be able to get ahead of issues and address them for you. Guys, I cannot sit here in the middle of my day, stop what I'm doing to call Mojo Dialer if I'm having an issue with my dialer. And what I found is that I was minimizing how much I was able to do because I was trying to do everything myself. And so you end up, and I found this, some of my clients and some, some people I talk to, investors, they end up limiting what they do because they're like, oh, well, you know, Janice, she can't do that. Or, um, you know, our Mike, he's not, he's not really good at that part of the business. So let's like, just focus on this market instead of expanding to three virtual markets or we don't have the capacity for that because our team's not skilled at that. Guys, that's the wrong answer. You have the wrong person in the seat if that's the case. Absolutely wrong person in the seat. If you're over here making excuses for your VA and minimizing your goals based off of them, everybody needs to step up and you do not want to be working alongside your employees. I've done that too much where I've, 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 brought them on board and I would like bring them on board and I would, they'd be doing their job, but they wouldn't be pull, pulling their own weight. For instance, they supposed to be calling the leads, following up with them, solely responsible for them. But if I, I found that I was, whenever they would forget to follow up with their leads, or I would see missed tasks. I would jump in there and just call the sellers instead of telling them to do it right. And it's painful because you're like, oh, I can do this myself, but guys, you're never going to get out of the quicksand if you don't start at least trying to pick your foot up and get out of the quicksand. If you're constantly in the quicksand and you're just, you know, uh, not trying to get out, 
you're constantly going to have the same issues. I hope you guys get my analogy here. Um, at some point, you got to uh, you got to trust your team members. And I found that trust comes with training them properly and knowing what you're going to train them on and what the heck they're going to do. Right. Guys, if you, if if they're joining your company and you're just like, uh, well, figure it out. You've done acquisitions before you cold called and you're asking them what to do and you're leaning on them. I know. I know, guys, I've been there before where you've been inadequate on a particular part of your company. And you've hired people. This is different with partners. You could hire partners to help you, but you've hired people, employees, Filipinos, five dollar an hour VAs to address a weak spot in your company. Guys, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if they were an excellent acquisitions manager, excellent, excellent lead manager. They went through all this training. They're looking to you as a business owner for guidance. And if you don't know what you're doing, or if it appears like you know what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing. Those VAs don't have any. They don't they they don't owe you anything just because you're an American and you're saying, hey, I own XYZ real estate business, guys, they're getting savvy. They they they, you know, if you're not presenting yourself right, they may not even apply to your company. And you may keep on getting bad talent because you're presenting yourself poorly. I know I get great talent because I present myself properly. I'm selling myself to my VAs great talent the same way that they're selling themselves to me through their resume. All right, guys. You guys have any questions so far? I know I've been going in. Any questions? Because uh, before I go forward, <clears throat> I want to make sure I, we're all on the same page here. You can drop them in the chat, guys. All right, go on YouTube. Okay, I actually have some questions here on YouTube. Let me stop my share and uh, see what we got here. Okay, so. Um, Okay, perfect. So Chevelle was asking, um, he's working on treadmill, watch me live. Great. Um, I'm going to get my workout in right after this. So Chevelle was asking, how do you get over the sellers, uh, people you call from being turned off when they hear Filipino accent, foreign accent from your cold caller? Boom. Great question. Guys, this is actually one of the misconceptions I'm going to cover. It's the accent. It's the accent. Guys, Filipino accents are not that big of a deal as you think they're really not they're really not now it depends on the level and there's levels here the first entry that your sellers are going to have to you to your company is through your cold calling and guys i do cold calling and i could go into that in another video but um you know that's just the best way to generate leads now um for wholesaling that and probably texting, but systematizing to be able to outsource it, cold calling by far. So I hear a lot of people say, hey, their English is not good. Therefore, they cannot do their job. And I will say there is a direct correlation between somebody's English comp comprehension, even in the States, and their, um, their common sense or their ability to do the job, uh, do, do a complex job especially if their first language is not English. But it's not as important as you think for certain positions. Cold calling, that's a three to $5 hour task, guys. I, I do not focus on training them, really, really hiring people that have really, really good accents because cold calling is a volume job and the attrition rate is about three months for that position. Meaning that people stick around for three months and then they're out. So you end up spending all this time, energy, and effort training a VA that's cold calling and say, oh, thanks, CC, but bye. Ask me why. I've done that. I've done that. And I realized that when it comes to cold calling, there is nothing you can do outside of having your caller call more hours in a day to get more leads. There, the absolute capacity is probably five on a really good day. And that probably happens once a month, probably once a quarter. You over an eight hour shift, you can expect your cold dollars to get one to two leads. Three leads is great. Four leads is really uncommon. Five leads is atypical. So what does that tell me? That tells me that, and, and, and guys, I was having people, I was having Americans do this. I split tested this. Americans, Central Americans. I was paying people $12 an hour, $3 an hour. I found the sweet spot was around $5 an hour. And they have to have a script. And they have to have a process that they're following. Now, I've realized that you do not have to have virtual assistants that have really good English if you provide them a script with cold calling. 
because they're going to have a specific path that they're taking the invest the the seller on. So they're not sitting here negotiating and talking about creative financing and all that stuff. Guys, it's entry level. And you're going to look so much more put together too by having different departments in your company. But the seller being, um, you know, uh, you know, vet it through your cold caller, then say, okay, hey, sounds like, um, you know, this, this is a property we want to work with. Let's go ahead and get you to our, um, our, our acquisitions team. All right. See if they could uh, work out a, a, you know, give you an actual offer for this property. And that's when they go to your lead manager, guys. All right. That's where they go to your lead manager and your lead manager's English needs to be um, a lot better. Now I, I work my, like my lead managers, their English has to be better because they're closer to my sellers, right? Cold calling is just general broad. It doesn't matter if I call, if I, if I call the same amount of people that my VA calls cold calling, I'm probably going to get the same connection rate. I'm probably going to get the same amount of hangups because it's a cold call. Do we have somebody live on the phone that's breathing and owns the property? We don't overqualify. I'm fine with underqualifying them and letting more people in my pipeline and then me deleting the leads when they come in my CRM than my cold callers having to overthink and, and end up screwing themselves out of leads. So it's important. That's just like that 15-year-old that that's working after school at Wendy's like me. I was working at Wendy's or McDonald's. And you know you need to be able to train them within 24 to 48 hours to start producing for you. Right. You know, it doesn't make sense to train a cold caller for months. What? And then a lot of people think cold callers could make lead managers and acquisitions managers. No, cold callers, guys, they are, you know, they're they're the lowest barrier to entry right there. So that's not an important issue. Acquisitions and lead managers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Their English has to be better. And I'm telling you, one thing that I started doing in my company is I hired an English accent trainer. So. We have somebody that I found um, I found through my network and she's from the Philippines. Her English is awesome. And so she's helping my team get their accents better. Everybody from my operations manager all the way down to my cold callers, they have to have a 30 minute and a one hour call with her a week to work on their accent, specifically when it comes to, and grammar, just talking to, talking to people, just shooting the breeze, right? Not sounding like a robot. The way that I'm able to get ahead now and, and, and seem different is because my VAs actually have personality. Everybody else's VAs, some of you guys on the call probably have VAs that sound like robots. And, you know, that, that's why that, that could be an issue why, um, you know, you're not converting leads and not um, getting a lot of people um, that are interested in your offer simply because they think that they're just talking to a robot. And when your cold callers call as well, you got to make sure that they know that somebody else is going to be calling them after that. And you guys actually pick up the phone and call because I cannot tell you how many people that I've followed up with that said, man, I've, I've, I've given this information to 30, 40 people. And you're the only person that called back because the lead probably looks cold and I'm not motivated to call as an investor, but my lead manager, I'm paying five to $6 an hour. He can call just like in McDonald's. If I'm the owner, Somebody has to get popped by grease and somebody has to be uh, fixing those fries. Does it have to be me, the owner? No, but somebody has to do this. That's how you need to start looking at your business, guys. Okay. Great question, guys. Great question so far. Let me see what else we got over here. Um, that was a good question, Chevelle. So let me go ahead and go through my, um, my presentation, my friend. And then I'm going to get to some of your questions. Guys, it, it, drop them. I'll get to them at the end here. Like I said, this is interactive. I'm not, um, it's 1228 p.m. Eastern time. I'm not, um, this isn't pre-recorded or anything. So, okay. Um, I skipped around a little bit. Okay, yeah. Let me go ahead and talk a little bit uh, about what I've been up to. And then I wanted to actually show you guys some resumes here of some VAs and just some tips that you guys can take when you're hiring going forward. Um, so what I've been up to, guys, since 2020, I've hired over 300 VAs. Like I was telling you earlier, it's a good coffee. Like I was telling you earlier, I realized that I, I was not retaining talent. 
Now, hiring 300 VAs, you're like, oh, that's awesome. But that's a lot of trial and error with figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And I'm glad I went through this because now I could share with you guys what's actually important, what actually you need to be focusing on in your company when you're hiring these people. Guys, when even when just even when you're trying to go through applications, you want to have your people jump through hoops. And there's things that I look for in my VAs that I may not even put out there in my, that I'm looking for in my job application. What, what do I mean by this? So when I post a job announcement, I may say, hey, submit your 16 personalities, personality type, and your voice mem and um, a voice recording. I don't ask them for their resume. Why? Because that's supposed to be self-explanatory. Those are, those are intangible things that we're looking for because we want people to go the extra mile. If you have somebody that submitted a resume to you, they not only submitted a resume, but they also submitted a cover letter, meaning they said, hey, CC, I saw your job announcement. This is my resume and this is my job experience. And guys, I had somebody that actually submitted a custom video for me, for my company. And I'm going to go off topic here um, and actually show you guys that uh, I should be able to find that here quickly. Um, and I was quite impressed when I saw this. Um, so I was like, man, this lady ended up uh, sending me a custom video, creating a custom video for my uh, for the job position. I'm going to show you guys what this looks like here. Share my screen again. Uh, all right. <laughs> video application for CC Garland Marketing. I didn't ask her to do this. Your, if you present yourself correctly, you'd be surprised with the pay cuts that people would do because they're more concerned about working for a legitimate business that would give them longevity and they're able to work from home. Guys, let me tell you something. Virtual assistants right now, especially in the Philippines, we need to be looking there. We need to be looking there because they are at the point where um, COVID was, the COVID restrictions were really, um, really strict for the last two years. And it's a small island and I get it. But now that uh, COVID is over, um, so they say that they're, they're requiring them to come back to the jobs. Well, guess what? During those two years, people had babies. They got used to working from home. Some of them moved away from the capital to back to, um, you know, some of the outskirts, some of the suburbs. and right now we have our pick of the litter of top, 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 top tier talent, people with law degrees. I've interviewed people that um, that work for some of the top um, other investors in this industry. You'd be surprised, guys. Um, some some VAs, uh, one VA that I hired on behalf of one of my clients, um, you know, they were, she was doing acquisitions, cold calling all the way to acquisitions, made the, v, the made her employee like several millions of dollars. And the guy just kicked her aside and never even told her when when he was closing deals and i don't even think it was paying our commission so guys i'm looking at that and we got to be re real careful here the the i'm gonna keep it up a hundred here the type of culture that i'm seeing in america with the type of people we need to work these jobs people just don't want to work these jobs right for even if i were to pay them 20 dollars an hour and in the Philippines, they're they're grateful to have these possess have these jobs and have these positions. They're grateful, and I it's not like I'm guys. A job is 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 a privilege, not a right. And I found that people like thumb their nose up at stuff like this. You know, if they're in the states and you're talking about paying them like, hey, I can only afford based off of you know, I could pay them more, afford to pay them more, but it doesn't make sense to pay somebody $20 an hour to do a $5 an hour task. Then you're going to get to a situation when you add in lead um, employees, list pulling costs, skip tracing costs, um, and then just cost of doing the deal, right? Title closing, and then your, your software and tools. You're going to break even at that point. Labor and data costs are the most important, are the most um, costly things. So if you're paying $20 an hour to an American 
that that just doesn't make sense. And nobody's going to work for five dollars an hour, guys. So I hope you're seeing what I'm talking about here is that it makes sense to go overseas. You have to go overseas. Now, who's going to work for five dollars an hour? Well, for three dollars an hour, that's the average salary for a Filipino that works inside of a brick and mortar building in the Philippines. And I've been getting hearing the word on the street that the call center stuff is becoming really toxic and they're wanting to work from home. And investors, you guys right now, I'm seeing that we need a lot of, we need some assistance with getting VAs in our company. So guess what? We have two, 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 a match made in heaven, heaven here. We have employees or we have you guys and real estate investors that need to um, get their companies systematized. And Filipino virtual assistants are the people to do it for you for a reasonable price. And they're willing to work for that. Don't think you're ripping anybody off or anything like that. They're, these are grown adults and they're able to sustain their um, their their quality of life with what we're paying them. And $5 an hour to start off is like excellent. That is excellent for them. And having upward mobility and I do profit sharing. So when I close a deal, everybody gets paid in my company. I pay my acquisition team a little bit more, but um, everybody does get a piece of that from operations down to my cold calling team. Okay. So guys, over this time, I've gotten really good at hiring um, talent. And what I realized the most important things that I'm looking for whenever I'm hiring is, are, do they have good comprehension? Do they understand what I say? How I'm speaking to you guys now, and I may go off and, and, and just go off on a tangent on the interview to see if they could keep up with my language. I may throw out a, a, an SAT word like octogenarian or pusillanimous to see if they pick up on it. My team last night or yesterday, we were talking to them and I said magnum opus and they knew what it was. I, I was like, okay, 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 okay. And so guys, if you give them the opportunity, you'd be surprised at what they can do. I found that a lot of times investors don't know what to give them to do. So how, how, how okay, so if you don't know what they're supposed to be working on, how do you know if they're doing a good job or not? If you don't know what, where your destination is, how do you know when you've arrived? If, I'm, if I get in my car and I say, hey, I'm just going to go drive. I'm going to the beach. Well, what, what beach? Which one? Miami Beach? You know, Carolina Beach? Myrtle Beach? Folly Beach? Where, where am I going? I'm just going to go drive. And I'm going to get frustrated because I'm never going to get there, but I never even stated where I was going to start with. This is an issue and we need to have a clear path for our team members when they come on board with us a training path we need to have a we need to have a a a clear schedule for them to follow and 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 support system when they come on board something as simple as having slack you know i got my people i'll open up my slack um workspace for you guys to hear see so I got all my teams here in Slack. Yeah, so, right. So I got all my teams here in Slack. Um, you know, this is my op, my leadership team. And um, I got Alex here, right? And then I got my other team here. I don't want to reveal anything proprietary, but um, these are, I, I have a company rhythm. And so you want to make them feel like they're part of a team. What I realized is when I had a cold calling team around this time last year, I had like 50 cold callers and I was had them for myself and for other investors. They wanted me to manage them. That was a little bit too stressful. But during that time, I realized that they're working their own shift on the opposite side of the world by themselves at home. And it may just be them. Well, what I found out is that they had their own little chat room in Skype or in Slack where they were talking to each other, sharing memes and stuff. I said, ah, community is really important. Culture, right? Culture doesn't mean just being nice and, you know, sharing one good thing that you did over the weekend. No, it means like, hey, having a rhythm. Okay, every every Monday morning, we're going to have a, a team training, right? And then share the share the wins, share the losses that we've had over the last week keep everybody on the same page. You don't you don't want to just hire somebody and then the next time you meet up with them is when there's an issue and you're reactive. 
or you don't want to hire anybody because you have all this stuff going on in your business and you're like, oh, okay, now it's time to hire somebody. That's hiring somebody from the wrong place. And what's going to happen, you're going to have this accordion effect or the slinky effect where they get on board and they put all your fires out. Then you're not going to have anything for them to do because you hired a firefighter, not, not somebody for a particular role. And you'd be surprised with how much one person can do in your company if you have a particular role for them. And what I mean by that is one critical task and maybe two secondary ones. For instance, our lead manager. Lead manager's job is what? To call, uh, to follow up with sellers to vet them and follow up with them as soon as they come from our cold calling team. And after they call, call they follow up with them, it's, them to, it's their job to determine, is this lead cold, warm, or hot? Do I follow up with them in a month, two, three months, or do I give them an offer right now and, and an exact offer through email? That's the exact path. It doesn't change every single time. So we know when we bring somebody else in that I can actually have my lead manager start training their subordinates. And guys, I've done my training with my personal team once this year. And after that, they train everybody internally. Other people that have me training their people, I do that. I've been doing that training. But internally, my team members train themselves, right? If I have somebody who's an operations manager, hey, Jay, get on the call with, you know, Alex. Teach him how to log into Podio. Teach him how to log in investor views. Teach him how to um, send emails off. Teach him how to draft up offers, right? You'd be surprised once you start putting your document in your processes every single step. Guys, just try this. Just one thing that you're doing in your company. Just say it's, 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 it's acquisition. Just document it. 10-step acquisition process. And then you'd be surprised with the little steps that are involved, what, what people can do if you hire somebody that's just $5 an hour and you break it into little steps. Now, if you say this is an acquisition process and you know, when you're on the call, you negotiate and you do this and you do that, you may see it may seem like it all falls on your shoulder, but 80% of it might be able to be done through a VA. For instance, you know, let's just say you go and look at um, the mo three most recent comps within half a mile. Let's just say you're um, going into MLS and you're, uh, you know, seeing if there's any land or lots that sold around it, you know, doing your due diligence, talking to the, you're verifying the owner, checking the register of deeds, doing a like title search. Well, if that's part of your process and you document that, you're like, okay, wait a second. In my 10-step process, there's seven things here that I do over and over again that a VA can really do. And in your acquisition process, boom, it's you that are heading acquisitions and you can have a junior acquisitions manager that's doing part of it. Guys, that's, that's what we do. It's a team. It's a team, man. And um, I love building teams. I realize this is the automation. And your job as a business owner, what I do, guys, is I cheerlead and I train and I coach. So the training happens when the first week when they're on board, that's the same. And coaching happens weekly, right? So I'll hop on a call with my lead manager. We'll go through the leads. Okay, tell me what's up with this lead, that lead, and that lead. And he may say, okay, this person's 99 years old. Every time I call them, they can't hear me, but they say they want to sell. How do we figure out that issue, Right. That's something that needs to be brought up to me. But there's going to be a lot of other leads that they just need to handle themselves. And they know that because we have processes created. So I say, hey, man, these types of leads don't even need to be brought up to my attention. I found that even if you have VAs, guys, if you can't trust them to do things in your business, it's going to be taking up the mental bandwidth in your mind. You might as well be working on it. If you're concerned about, man, did they follow up with John Smith? Did they get that offer back? Guys, that is stressful. And the next level is having an operations manager, like a chief operations officer, somebody who, who basically is a six-figure employee, you're paying like $6 an hour. And they're able to help handle and manage your whole company. So they're not really doing anything per se. They're making sure ev all the departments are, are talking to each other. They're following up with their title company. They're making sure the lock boxes are on the door. They're making sure your properties are listed. They're making sure everything is going through these specific checklists every single time. And then they're making sure that your systems are constantly getting better and better. We're hiring people with all with these skill sets. You may say, man, how do I find these people? Where do I find them from? Guys, I have my own way that I'm sourcing them, right? And you can talk to my team about that, but I'm going to show you guys some examples of the type of... Um, 
the type of individuals that you guys can get right now from the Philippines and what you need to be looking for for your lead manager and operations manager. Those are the two jobs you need. Operations is like general admin, general admin, and they can do transaction coordination. If you're doing less than five deals a month, you could get away with operations lead manager. You could probably get away with a super, super sharp lead manager who's good at operations as well. And so when I say lead management, they're responsible for the CRM, executive assistant CRM. That's what their responsibility is. You need to, you're going to be able to go to them and tell them, hey, Alex, hey, John, hey, Mike, call this seller. Call this seller and get this information from them. Or, hey, set up the appointment for me. So you're not playing phone tag. It's important that they tee up the lead for you because if you have a hot lead that comes in your CRM, you may say, okay, man, let me call this lead. They don't pick up and you forget about them. That's why it's the lead manager's job to, to keep you up to date on what's happening with the leads. And there's ways that you do this, guys. There's, you're just, there's just ways that you make sure that they, it's hiring these people to make sure that you're hiring the best people to, to, to do this for you and you're not, and you could trust them to do this. Um, let me clarify that a little bit. It could get really stressful if you're not aware or, or you don't even know if your person's touching base with your leads um, or following up with them properly or putting them or getting the right information from them. That's why you want to have those weekly calls to go over that information, right? Not every lead, but I tell my team, if there's 20 leads that come in over the week, which is what we're doing on average usually in most of our markets. There's going to be about two or three leads that need to go to, I say, the board. So we need to bring, put those leads on the board, meaning we all need to get on a call just to talk about how do we unstuck this lead because there's something there. We may get on the call and two out of three of those leads may be nothing. We may say, okay, there's nothing here. Or we, you know, there's nothing there. Or we may have one lead that's like, okay, there's a tenant in the house. Okay, Alex, we need to get the, we need to get the um, no, if this is month to month. Our annual, and if this annual, if this is an annual lease, we didn't know know when it was signed and when this sucker, um, and how much he's paying. So you're delegating as a business owner. You should be thinking, guys, and I challenge you guys from this day forward, thinking what if something needs to be done in my business, who can do it for me? Who can do it? And I have in my company right now where I can pull, it, I can pull anybody in my company to do about just about everything. The only things that I have to do are review my HUDs and I still do my marketing, right? Are my zip code analysis and analyze my virtual markets. I do that still uh, because every dollar I spend is based off of getting that right. So I want to actually show you guys a few resumes here. Um, if that's okay with you, just of some um, of the talent that you guys could get before I wrap this thing up. And um, just to show you guys what you're looking for and what good talent looks like. So whenever I'm putting a resume out for my employees, a few things I'm looking for are, um, let me pull his resume out in one second. I closed out um, their resumes here. Uh, Alex. And let me go to John. Okay, cool. All right, so this is one that was just hired, um, not in my company, but for um, another guy, part of our program. So he, um, this is this is somebody we interviewed for in um, executive, not executive assistant role, uh, lead management role, right? And what stood out? Number one, guys, he was persistent. And this is one thing I do with my VAs is that are with my prospects is I might put them on ice a little bit. I might say, hey, I'm interested, uh, but let me get back to you and see if they <laughs> see if they pursue me. Now, that's my personality type. That's who I am. That's who I am. And I'm not telling you guys, you got to do this exactly like me, but I I want I cannot replicate my time. I've done these trainings so many freaking times, I, I I don't think I could do another like training when it comes to training a lead manager from top to bottom or even operations manager. So I, I, I need to be able to qualify the people beforehand. So before I spend time putting them through my training program and, 
and onboarding them and giving them access to my tools. Number one, I got to know if I can trust them. Number two, are they motivated to do the job? That eliminates so much. I don't have hub staff and all this stuff or HubSpot, whatever that thing is where you're recording people's um, camera or their computer, they're micromanaging them. No, if you're hiring somebody to be the responsible for your leads and your CRM, you're just completely setting the tone off wrong if you're saying, hey, uh, where are you? I don't trust you. Or you need to check in with me every hour. On Slack, they know to send me a good morning message. They know to send put the little pizza emoji up there um, when they're on break or coffee emoji if they're on coffee break. We covered this in the onboarding training. These are standards we need to cover. If you do not cover these, you're just, they can't read your mind. You have to give them some direction. This is very important, guys. Very, very important stuff here. Okay. So my guy, John, is a um, couple of things that stood out is that his work experience is all centered around real estate from 2015. And he has a very clear path forward with, with actually getting on, not getting on board, but um, with, with his experience. Notice he didn't work for real estate and then work for Bell South. Bell South is old school. Well, I'm dating myself now. <laughs> work for uh, <laughs> Verizon a phone company and then work for like a local restaurant, it's all continuous and it all is aligned. Now, you do not need somebody with, with investor experience to do the operations manager job, but I would prefer somebody who's at least done cold calling to be a lead manager. But if they haven't, I'm looking for customer service experience. I'm looking for supervisor experience because everybody that you're hiring, should you should hire them based you should hire them with the intent of bringing them up and moving them up in your company. All right. So with him, I saw, I like the resume. He had a picture there and his, 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 his experience aligned directly with what I'm looking for. And what I'm looking for is a lead manager. It's an appointment setter. But if I would have just went in here with like, okay, I want to, if we, if we have a good vibe or if he sounds like he's saying the right things on to me, I may say, okay, that's a good fit. I don't have any standards. Then when they get in my company, guess what? It's going to be the blind leading the blind. And you're going to get stressed out because they're not producing any results for you. And they're going to get frustrated because they don't have any direction. And eventually the VA will just leave. And that happened to me over and over again. And let me know if this is something you guys have dealt with. I know for me, this has been something that's really been... Um, a thorn on my side. All right, guys, I'm going to go about uh, 10 more minutes here. Then I'm going to, um, then I'm going to wrap this up. If you guys have any questions, please drop them. Um, my guy Chevelle on YouTube, he's going in, which is awesome. So appreciate those uh, questions there. Now, let me tell you guys, give you guys a sauce here, you know, a little secret sauce when it comes to um, evaluating these people. And this is something that I do. And I'll give this to you guys. So 16personalities.com, 16personalities.com. I am big into psychology and I want to stop guessing as to if I was getting a good employee or a great employee, or is there any way I can at least eliminate some of these people when they come through? So in my job announcement, what I have them do is submit their 16 personalities um, type to me. And if they don't do that, guess what? I'm bouncing, I'm walking. So I hear a couple of announcements I put for the ESL tutor. So look, this person did not include their, they didn't include their 16 personality type. So I don't care if they were overqualified. You get follow directions. If you cannot follow simple directions now, do you think you're going to be able to follow directions when I give them to you in my company? These are intangibles that you're looking for when you're evaluating your applicants, and this will save you time from reading um, resumes because you can't really get a good, you can't really get a good idea of, of this person's character and their intangibles by reading their resumes. For instance, this person right here, she, look, she, it's so funny because she applied for the operations manager when I uh, put this up in August, and then she applied for my ESL um, job position when I put this up on the 4th. And guess what? She did not follow the directions. I didn't even open this. <laughs> this really helps me right here 
eliminate poor applicants. I just don't even, I don't even look past it. I'm, I don't give them the benefit, a benefit of the doubt. I don't do that. You know, guys, you have, you guys are the ones offering the opportunity to, um, to pay somebody, to give them employment. And you need to take that very seriously. And you need to understand that right now you're able to source top, top talent, but you need to know what you're looking for. I want to see if I can see, find um, some individuals for, um, for the operations manager. All right, I hired, okay, so I put out a dispositions manager. And this is what I do on a dale, daily basis, guys. So I'm interested on this role and send an email, including my updated resume. So, but she didn't include 16 personality. She might've included that there. This guy right here, I submitted my application through email you provided. Did you follow my instructions? I'm gonna go through a few more guys here just to give you some practical examples. Okay, so this is somebody who went through the instructions, um, Maricel Denag, and I'm pretty sure I went through a, 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 an interview with her. So she actually put her job, this is what I call a cover letter, she put her cover letter here, okay? And she had her voice snippet. I don't know if you guys can hear this because I got my uh, earphones on, but she gave me her voice snippet and she gave me her 16 personality type. All right, and so she was an ENFJ. All right, guys, so let me get down to it. Here's, here's a bit of a hack you're going to get a lot of people that have this personality type ENFJ. And this is an extrovert, intuitive, feeler, judger. I found that this is like the general Filipino virtual assistant, like majority of Filipino virtual assistants that I apply will have this personality type. And I'm very, very mm, iffy on hiring people with this personality type, unless they have specific job skills or unless they have job experience, because this is somebody who's an extrovert, who's good at um, good at talking on the phone, but they might not be detailed oriented. They're good for cold calling, but are they good at managing my CRM and details? And this is one thing that investors have as well, far as a common misconception is that they think that because somebody can breathe and talk on the phone and, and has good English, like voice, you know, their, their verbal English is good that they can freaking call cold call and do acquisitions. And that's not the case, guys. What you're doing is you're finding somebody with good English and trying to make them work, trying to fit them in that position. And that's idealism, guys. That's not really what it is. I, I've done that before. Um, let me see if there's somebody else here, right? A lot of these people, guys, do not include their 16 personalities type. They just simply were like, oh, here's um, here's a here here's my here's my overview. Just applied, and so I actually asked this guy to take a 16 personalities test, and he didn't respond. So most of these people aren't even going to respond. So you don't even need to chase them down. Okay. Um, I take hiring very seriously, guys. One other thing that I do as well is this is I have them take what's called a, a Clifton Strength Finders test. Now this costs money, this costs like 40 bucks. So 16 personalities is free. So you can hire, you can, if you need to hire somebody as an operations manager, you need an introvert. So you know every single person that comes in through that's an ENFJ or an extrovert, they're not good for operations. And you know, if they're an introvert, they're probably not good for English speaking, or I'm sorry, talking on the phone. All right. so. That's something I want to just emphasize here to you all. And let me give you an example here. All right, so if I go back to 16 personalities and here are the types. Well, my my type, I'm an INTP. You probably won't um, come across this in the wild, but you got your analyst. So there's 16 types, so 16 roles or archetypes that people fall through, and this is extremely accurate. Um, you have your analysts, and these are going to be your people probably that are not going to be 
um, employees in your company. Um, for instance, INTPs, we're we're like we're like uh, <laughs> we're like nerds. You won't. There's not really a good fit for us in real estate companies, um, even operations. Architect. So INTJs, these are business owners. So you guys probably fall in these fields. Bosses, you don't want to hire somebody with an ENTJ, a commander that's an employee. They just don't fit that criteria. I'm telling you guys what you need. You need our people that fit this uh, mold called SJs. SJ, right? So the second and fourth letter are S and J, respectively. These are sensor judges. These are the people that move the world along. They're the generators. They have a consistent energy source. ISTJs, these are the people I hire for operations managers. Um, this That's basically the hack. Um, every single one has panned out outside of the ones that have had, I've had a couple of people that have had some like uh, personality issues, like wanting to be commanders. But for the most part, this for operations manager, this is perfect for admin assistants. SFJs are all right. Um, ESTJs are good for um, operate for exact not executive assistance for um, um, going blank here lead managers and also trainers, right? So they're a little bit of the an introvert and an extrovert, but they're good at organization. And ESFJ, I don't let them anywhere near my business. Um, explorers ISTP, no, no. Nope, don't hire them. ISFP, nope, don't hire them. ESTP, don't hire them. ESFP, don't hire them. They, these people, they don't fit in your company at all. Like they literally don't. And guys, I, if this sounds harsh, I'm just telling it what it is. These people don't fit in your company. Look, this person's over here dancing. They're going to come in here and just want to dance in your business. Now, this isn't to say that these people don't have value in the real world because um, I'm an INTP, but I'm not going to hire myself to do the job because I, I'm, you know, I like going through data and stuff. I don't like talking to sellers and doing all that stuff. So we need to hire somebody to do that for us. Okay. I need an FP. This person I found that doesn't really have any true skill sets when it comes to working in our business as an employee. And guys, understand that we don't hire people that we like. And what investors tend to hire people that they like and that are like them. Guys, no. We're not making friends here. We're not bidding to our employees. We're not doing any of that. What we're doing is we're finding people, one person to do the job of three people, not overworking them, but maximizing this individual. If I hire an INFP to do an ISTJ's job, I'm going to end up training this person, be like, why don't, why don't they just, don't get it? Maybe I need to create more trainings for them. And you probably just have the wrong person for that role. If they don't get it, and if you guys have employees that just don't get it, it's time for them to bounce. If they've been with you for more than three months. Now, I would say I would evaluate on your end and see if you provide them with the training they need to succeed. But if not, if you did provide them with training and they're just not getting the job, you, you got you to let them go. You got to move on. Got to move on, guys. And you don't hang on to poor talent. You hire slow and fire fast. OK. All right, guys. So that's about going to um, wrap up the training. I am going to tell you guys, if you do want to learn how to hire people, I do have my build to scale program. And guys, this thing is a beast right now. And I want to tell you guys about that here, because what we do in this is we actually go through and implement all this stuff along your side. So in this program, guys, I actually do all the lead manager training myself. All right, well, with my team. So when you we show you how to hire your lead manager, and then they go through a one week training with us, right? One week before they even start on your campaign. But guys, you, you have to go through our process. You have to watch the videos because we had somebody in the program freaking submit a lead manager and we get on the call and they're an American. <laughs> I'm like, guys, there's a reason why we, I hope you know why now there's a reason why we hire Filipinos. So it's literally step by step by step by step. You will not be lost, but you got to follow it. We're getting people within 30 to 45 days getting um, contracts. Um, one of my guys, uh, Alex, he has, not Alex, Gabe, he has, he made 50K in contracts within like the first month. And this isn't a get you deal program or anything like that. It's basically taking all the other programs that you have and making sense out of it, systematizing it. 
right? What did you do? And what, so you learn wholesaling and what are the steps to learning? You probably went through like five or 10 programs. What's important to know and what's not. And there's a specific path that you need to follow to succeed. And every single investment company has these departments, lead management, analyzing virtual markets, choosing the best market. If you're a wholesaler, you do not need to be tied to the market you're currently like living in. It's probably not the right market to be in. How do you get the most bang for your buck? How do you have cold call? How do you build out a cold calling team? How many do you need? How do you know when to change your list? How do you know after your list goes bad, when do you pull your next one? And in what market? How do you know when to change your market? And how do you teach this to somebody else? All this is done within about four to five weeks. You can have everything systematized where you have somebody doing basically 80% of this for five to six dollars an hour. And guys, I don't play around when it comes to paying employees. I do not overpay people for their skills. I try to find somebody, if I'm paying five dollars an hour, I'm fine, I want to find somebody that's skilled at $15 an hour. I'm telling you guys, they are out there, they are out there, but you got to know where to look and how to source these people. And you have got to be able to impress them. You'd be surprised with the people that are skipping over you right now because you're not presenting yourself well. I had a, um, I had a, a client that I hopped on an interview with because in the beginning, back in April, I was actually going on the calls and conducting the interviews for people. And he was on the call and he turned his camera on. My client had, he, it was a dark background. I was like, dude, how much confidence do you think that VA is going to have if they, they're looking all nice, they're in their suit, they're, they're nice um, Sunday's best presenting themselves to you and your, your microphone quality sucks and you're all in the background and stuff. That's why I'm there to sort of smooth things over to make you guys look better to make sure that your VAs know that they're coming into an actual system. Because I've had VAs that come on board and then they lose confidence and they're like, okay, this company is unorganized and they, they stop responding over Slack and then they bounce. So as soon as your people are hired, they need to have an onboarding process and a training curriculum. And I found that if you guys are working nine to five in your business or in another, not in, a, in another job, your training is gonna be put to the wayside. That is so important. And it doesn't take them a long time to get spun up, maybe like a week. And then they can start cold calling to practice and follow up on your old leads to learn. And then after about two weeks, they, they got the job, All right? And one thing we're doing as well is hiring that accent coach to assist go ongoing with your lead manager's um, um, accent. So guys, this is it. We're enrolling people now. I was keeping this in, you know, like internally, I was only bringing on like one or two people a week, but we're ready to blow this thing up now. Um, we have a uh, twice weekly calls. So I have one call with my, with my team. So one call with me coaching and the Facebook group is going to be live. And that's one to two on Tuesdays. And then on Thursdays, we have a lead manager call where you give your lead manager the zoom invite. And once you get their zoom invite, they're going to, they hop on that call. So you guys aren't on there. It's just a one-on-one -on -one with me and talking to them and going through and seeing what issues they're having just to make sure they're maintaining that daily rhythm, that weekly rhythm, that's company culture up until you guys have your company cult culture established, right? And we move fast, this is interactive. This isn't like throwing you in a Facebook group and letting you do whatever. There's a clear path. And like, if I could get your campaign set up by that third week, um, within month two, within 30 days, you know, you should be able to get, guys, within a week or two, you should be able to get something on your contract. Because it's just a byproduct of you systematizing your company and hiring employees that you're going to get deals. And there's probably stuff in your CRM right now that you're missing. And I want to go find that and get you guys that get you a return on your investment. Like, seriously, you spent money on marketing. You probably have leads you haven't followed up with in months or a year. The longer they've been in there, the better. All right, guys. So if you want to sign up, guys, no pressure here. I'm just going to leave this open to you and I'll drop this in the comments and also I'll um, I'll send this out in an email. Uh, my program is 9,997. I talked to a lot of people and they told me, hey, dude, um, we got to pay for marketing. So can you make this easy on us? I said, yeah, let's just get people in. It's a 12 week program for three payments of uh, $3,333. I think that is way, way, way affordable and really guys with what we're providing here 
and their return on investment. It is, it is solid. All right, guys. So you got to roll there. So glad that you guys joined the uh, this webinar. If you need anything from me, don't hesitate to hit me up. Um, I hope you guys got a lot out of this. I'm going to do these weekly probably um, and then just go through there. So guys, um, yeah, hey, so this is going to stay up. Entre Entrepreneur 215, this will be stay up as a recording. All right, guys. So I'll chat with you later. Have a great week.